industrial unions are better um, well, better for unions' rights, uh, workers' rights, and um, within this, I'm going to be uh, using the subpoint of why work workplace unions are less effective um, for for the representation of workers. But before I define what these industrial unions would look like, let our stance the opposition be clear. We do not deny that both workplace and industrial unions cannot exist together, and we do believe that both of them are important for the workforce. However, fundamentally, we will explain to you why industrial unions can create industri industry-wide change, and this makes mass political action easier, and therefore industrial unions would be more preferable. So a workplace union is a union um, that only involves the workers of one specific company. And so these unions would there, then therefore tend to focus on directly negotiating with the management of that individual company. And later in my speech, I'm gonna highlight how this in itself is problematic for um, the well-being of the workers and how it's less effective in implementing change for them. And by contrast, an industrial union is a union with workers from the entire industry. And industrial unions are more often uh, more often will try and focus on trying to implement industry wide standards for workers rights, rather than just negotiating with individual companies. And it's this meaningful mass change that truly positive positively affects the lives of workers, and this is why we find it more preferable. Our burden of proof in this debate is that we will prove to you that industrial unions are more effective in protecting the rights of workers and improve and overall improving the efficiency of the industry as a whole. And so this leads me on to our argument on why industrial unions are better for the rights of workers. So to provide a, to provide a mechanism for the workplace union, we think that it works by having um, the workers, like I said, negotiate with a company. But ultimately, with this mechanism, it's the, it's the manage, uh, management making the decisions, not the workers. We find this detrimental as it inhibits the abilities for workers to deal with the issues um, that, they, that they find. Um, sorry, was that a point? Yes. Um, I'll take your point. On your side of the house, there is still a collective bargaining aspect where leadership of the union is directly negotiating with companies, but they're directly negotiating with every company at once. How is this more effective? Well, we, we find that the fact that they're negotiating with the, um, the whole industry as, as a whole, we find it uh, we find it like more preferable because we'd see industry change rather than if you're just um, uh, negotiating with a specific management position, you might be um, uh, implementing change for a smaller group. Whereas what we find uh, more preferable is change for an entire industry, which is um, uh, more impactful. And so we find it um, detrimental um, in workplace unions for the workers to deal with the issues um, just with their management and achieve rights for the following reasons. The first is that workers are still working for a company and therefore would, might be hesitant in bringing up ideas and complaints because at the end of the day, their earnings depend on the comp company and their bosses. So we find it less, them, less likely to bring up their um, concerns or issues as we believe that um, this industrial change um, is more effective to uh, implement um, for the rights of workers. Two, we see Fine. a conflict. Um, I'll take your point in uh, at the end of this um, argument. Uh, we see a conflict of interest between the managers and workers. Their rights um, clash with the policies of the company. So we might see bias that is much less present with industrial unions, which overall provide a fairer solution to representing workers' rights. Also three, um, it's unclear what the checks and balances are um, uh, with workplace unions to, to ensure that the company actually listens to the rights of workers, whereas in industrial change, we see um, a change that is more likely to be implemented for the rights of most workers. And four, um, we see conflict, the com conflict between companies' objectives and the workplace unions, because um, companies will want profits and therefore we believe that wages will, might, will be less likely to arise. And therefore, we think it's less likely for the rights of workers um, to be achieved under their side. And I'll, I'll take your point now quickly. If a, if a worker is so scared of their employers that they're not going to create a workplace union, what incentive do they have to unionize against the entire industry, which includes the company that they are so afraid of? Well, um, this is actually going to lead into my later point, but we think that when you're tackling a whole uh, industry as a whole, different factions of the in entire industry could come together and therefore they can implement meaningful change together. It's that sense of togetherness that is really um, uh, pr that provides workers with confidence to tackle um, the industry as a whole, rather than just uh, try and uh, try and defeat this, their, their objective um, through the company as on their own, basically. 
On the flip side, to provide a mechanism for industrial unions and why they're more preferable on our side of the house, there are lots of different sectors within a company. So we see workers, cleaners, and um, uh, uh, many different people, and they belong to different industries, but they exclusively have different problems. This, um, this, the issues that can arise from this, um, if they're blended together, um, are significant. I'll explain this now. Industrial unions are better set up to deal um, with the issues of the workers. Um, in a workplace union, a spe like specific areas of the job make up a minority. So it's unlikely that issues may be taken seriously due to limited resources of workplace unions. And it's more efficient for them to focus on the majority um, uh, within a company. And we find it preferable that industrial unions represent all. Within industrial unions, no thank you, um, they create forums for specific minorities within an industry, like I said, to unite under different factions so they have a stronger voice and make it more likely for issues to be dealt with. And this actually pressures the government to make change because any disruption within the industry is, is like important to the government as it could cause economic disruptions. And therefore the government has an incentive to intervene to act in the best interest of the individuals and the economy. So it's more likely that the government will listen to these issues. And additionally, the government versus company, we're going to, uh, additionally, with the government versus the company, we see, um, we're, we're going to explain who's the better actor to initiate change. It's the obligation of the government to incentivize to protect its citizens, um, as this has positive feedback connection with trade unions, so it's more likely to enact change. Uh, change. And also, personally, it's personally detached from the workers, so it will not be held back by biases. And this versus the company, who is more likely to be profit oriented, whilst workers are the core of the company, it's ultimately the incentive to make more money. And so it's more likely for conflicts of interest to occur between companies. So therefore, industrial unions as a whole provide a more weighed balance to implement meaningful change that positively affects the lives of the workforce. And this in itself provides a more sustainable future for industries as a whole. Proud to propose. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker, for the fine remarks. I now invite the first speaker from side opposition. All right, uh, am I audible? Yes, you are. Okay, perfect. And I prefer my POIs to be verbal, so if you can unmute yourself, that would be great. The claim coming from Proposition 1 was incredibly simplistic. It seemed like their team line was just like, teamwork makes the dream work, and if there's industrial change, then we're going to solve all issues that workers face. The biggest problem with their side is that they neglect the fact that workers have very different interests, very different grievances, and work in companies that have completely different conditions. They never proved to us how in a industry that was so different, how they were going to get collective change together. Instead, what was likely to happen on their side of the house is that you got diluted change and change that only occurred at the least common denominator. They never provide you a single reason why they get unity on their side of the house as opposed to fragmentation. We argue that workplace unions are going to be far more representative and meet the direct needs that people ask for themselves. That's why we're so uh, like far ahead on side opposition. I'm going to forward two substantive arguments for side opposition, but before that, some framing and then rebuttal. First on the level of framing, I think we largely agree with side propositions framing that on our side of the house, there's less emphasis on industry-wide unions and there's more smaller unions that exist at a company-based level. But I want them to clarify in their next speech what industrial level change actually means because their entire case is very unclear. What kind of change occurs? Are they lobbying the government for legislative change? or are they working with different companies? I think side proposition needs to clarify this. I can clarify this for themselves because at the end of the day, what they need on their side of the house is still for management and CEOs of companies still to buy in the changes that occur across the industry. That's something that they need to clarify. Moving on to some responses to their arguments. They make a couple points. The first argument that they make is that like people are less likely to share their ideas and complaints. I don't think this is true. This is significantly worse on their side of the house because when you have an industry-wide union, there's so much bureaucracy. Point of information. 
thank you. So if I'm a small worker, it's much less likely that my concern will be heard in an industry of thousands upon thousands of workers versus just my simple workplace. So if people have grievances, those grievances are much more likely to be communicated within a smaller workplace than in a broad industry. Secondly, they make this claim about how like minorities are going to stand to benefit. I don't think this is true. I think on their side of the house, minorities are less likely to have their voices heard and have less leverage. Because for example, if we take, if we take, for example, like the steel working industry within the United States, this is a white dominated industry, but there's specific places in the United States like Alabama or like Georgia, where there's primarily black workplaces. Those workplaces on our side of the house can get specific changes to deal with things like harassment and racism. But on their side of the house, they have to go up to the white heads that run the industrial union and get support from them. That was significantly less likely than them working within their own workplaces and creating changes and different things like that. Their last idea was how they're going to pour resources and get different people working together. I'm going to respond to this within my own material. With that in mind, our first substantive argument is that we increase the effectiveness of unions. The thesis of this argument is that in a workplace, unions are better able to galvanize support from workers and accomplish their demands. The first of this argument is how we increase support. I want to note that people are reluctant to join unions for several reasons. A, because of the obligation of time. B, because of the dues of unions and different fees. C, because in society there's general union stigma. And D, there's a hierarchy that exists that deters people from joining unions. That is very important because in order for people to join unions, they need to know that their concerns are going to be met and they have to have a guarantee that there's going to be returns and tangible benefits from them joining the unions. There are three reasons why we get people to buy in and join unions on our side of the house. Number one, recruitment is significantly easier on our side of the house. It is more likely that you're going to join a union if it's someone that's in your workplace, workplace, i.e. a co-worker or someone that you trust that is coming and you're recruiting you rather than someone that's like an external marketing agent from the larger industrial union. Secondly, on our side of the house, we get much more specific messaging. People within the union are speaking to your specific issues as opposed to broad industry problems. So if, for example, you work for a manufacturing plant and the biggest concern is safety, you don't want to hear about hours and different things like that. You want to hear about safety. So messaging on our side of the house is more persuasive and more compelling because it's specific to the workplace. Finally, I think it's because you're more likely to see change quickly. When you have workplace unions, you're more likely to see immediate returns. This is number one, because like I said before, there's less red tape and bureaucracy that exists. But finally, for change to happen on their side of the house, there's to be large levels of buy-in, i.e workers across different companies have to come together and agree that a problem is an issue, strike for that problem, or lobby for that problem for that to be solved. That requires far more work than our side of the house. So if people are more likely to see returns at a faster pace, they were more likely to stay within the union. At that point, we not only get better recruitment, but people stay in the unions on our side of the house. Before I move on to my second layer, I can take a point if there is one. Okay, seeing no, no points, I'm um, going to move on second layer. Actually, yeah, go ahead. Don't you think in the uh, industrial union where people have, where different, com different people come from different backgrounds, they have different perspective of things, so therefore it would make things more efficient instead of um, bureaucratic? I think it makes it less efficient. If you have different perspectives, it's better for you to work in your specific workplace and get those demands accomplished rather than competing with 5,000 other people who have different interests than you to get something accomplished. That was the collective action problem on your side of the house. Second layer is how we improve the bargaining process. Companies are more likely to comply on our side of the house because the demands that unions make are specific to the workforce. The problem with an industry-wide union is that companies have different capacities. That is to say that a company like Starbucks that has billions of dollars in profits has less of an ability to support their workers than a smaller mom and uh, pop uh, coffee shop, right? So you can implement a one-size-fits-all solution for all companies. Why is this harmful? Number one, you get to a race to the bottom on their side of the house, which means that for you to get industry-wide standards, you need to dilute the demands to make sure that companies get buy-in that is even the lowest denominator of companies. Even if on our side of the house, we don't get the lowest denominator, at least the majority of people get better benefits, get comprehensive changes in wages and working conditions, while on their side of the house, they dilute changes. Secondly, on their side of the house, if they want to get more aggressive changes, they have to have longer extended strikes. And this is incredibly damaging because the longer strikes go, the less like income people are getting, the less like capable people, people are to pay for things like rent and pay people uh, and pay for things like food. This means 
means that people realize that the cost of joining a union is too high and they're less likely to join the union. Second substantive is how we get better representation for workers. Even if we assume that buy-in is symmetric, workplace unions are more are like more effective at getting like uh, improving working conditions for specific issues that companies face. First of all, I want to note that different companies experience different issues. So for example, like uh, Starbucks had a massive harassment and secrecy problem. Amazon had an issue of safety concerns and people working very long hours. That is to say that different companies within individual industries have different problems that affect them. The problem is that these specific issues are unlikely to be the result of the union at large in the industrial union, because the only way that the industrial union gets something accomplished is if there's broad base support from all workers. So while on their side of the house, they may get some base level working conditions accomplished, the more specific issues that people face, like harassment that, that's occurring, or racism, or, or issues of oppression that are occurring in the workplace, those specific issues don't get resolved on their side of the house. Why were we likely to get representative solutions for workers? There were three reasons. A, it's because workers have an established known relationship with the company administration that they collectively bargain against. Secondly, it's because there was less internal gridlock within the union because there's simply less people. On their side of the house, you're more likely to see competing interests and fracturing where different people have different concerns, which means that no one is able to agree on actual solutions. And finally, on our side of the house, you got more reliably engaged members. They're more likely to participate in strikes, and they know that those strikes are going to directly benefit them. For those reasons, not only do we get more benefits, more union strength on our side of the house, but we get representative solutions as well. Very proud to oppose. Time to speak up for different remarks. I now invite the second speaker from side proposition. Here, here. I will be starting in three, two, one. Today's side proposition have mistaken the whole motion. We tell that we are not arguing for a pure industrial uh, union. We tell that this motion is not a zero sum. We tell that industrial ref, uh, industrial union can also ex co coexist with workplace union. But what is the difference is that on our side, we prefer industrial ref, uh, industrial union better because we believe that industrial union could create an industrial wide change. And this is what is most important in this world. And this is the most urgent thing that we need to solve. And we think that it makes mass political actions easier and more efficient. So. Today, I will be bringing to this debate uh, on my substantive about how uh, industrial unions would be more efficient, would, would create better efficiency for the workforce. But before I start my substantive, um, four pieces of rebuttals. First, um, side proposition said that uh, because that uh, side proposition said that at the leadership of the unions need to communicate with every single company. So that's why it makes the whole thing less effective. However, we tell that if a policy is unanimously agreed by all workers, we see that there's a change that needs to be made. And we see that only at industrial uh, level that this change would be the most effective. And we tell that even if, even if they need to communicate with all the companies, we think this is still more effective because the workers in the same industry is likely to have similar demands. Or even if they are different, it's just a matter of time. We, we tell that in the end, at the end of the at the end of the time, we tell that uh, workers in the same industry would have similar goals and they argue for similar subs. So therefore, they will have to discuss these companies would have to discuss these issues anyway in the future. So therefore, we believe that on our side we would get more efficiency in the long term. So, and I will be expanding on that further in my point. Uh, second point of rebuttal on how on uh, their question of what does industrial level change mean. We think this is very obvious, right? We see that it looks like something like better safety standards for construction workers, um, less working hours, so, uh, increase in wages um, for different sectors, uh, catering to their needs. And we tell that maybe, for example, teachers arguing for uh, working for a smaller class size because um, working for a smaller class size. So we don't we don't think there's any confusion here and we don't think uh, why these kind of changes should not be on the industrial level and why is it um, not as important as the uh, workforce 
workforce change. So on to our third point of rebuttal is how how um, how work how workforce uh, workforce union would be create would be increasing the effectiveness. Uh, they say that they say that because they have this specific uh, demand for uh, different companies for different workforce in different companies, so therefore they are more likely to see the change quickly. However, the whole premise of their argument is uh, depends is is dependent on the workforce unions. Uh, is is dependent on workforce union. Uh, uh, working. However, they have not justified to us why little people means that it will work better. Mm -hmm. So therefore, their uh, explanations are just assumptions instead of um, uh, are just very shallow. On to the fourth point of rebuttal, they said that uh, oh, so people in the workforce, they uh, in the in the industrial union, these workers will have competing interests. However, they have not proven to us why workers from the same industry will have conflicting interests. However, on the other hand, we tell you that workers from the same industry is very likely for them to have the same um, to have the to have to, to have similar interests and similar things that they want to argue for, uh, because like, they are experiencing. Uh, the same uh, industrial problems, um, for example, uh, miners in the past, they were experiencing a uh, poor and um, poor working environment and those kind of stuff. So therefore, we believe that uh, the interest, there would not be competing interests. So therefore, there would not be a trade off in efficiency. Now, moving on to my uh, substantive on how it increased the work uh, efficiency of the workforce. So why is that? There are four ways of how we see this happening. First, we see that there's less repetitive work in the industry because A, uh, we do not need different people in different uh, places to work really hard for the same change to occur. We tell that, for example, construction workers who uh, fight for a higher salary uh, if they are in the industrial union and we tell that so therefore less human resources uh, are needed to negotiate for the same change and second reason um we tell that uh, industrial industrial union is a sort of like a melting pot because when pe when industrial unions industrial unions contain more people than workforce union you have people from a more diverse background so you have different points of views and perspective on things so therefore you have more ideas of change so uh, we have this intelligence of the majority that uh, we can solve the most urgent issues in this industry and that is the most important thing uh, in this debate and we tell that um, because there are more people there are more suggestions more suggestions on how this change could be uh, most effectively made so therefore we also get efficiency uh, of the workforce the third way of how how efficiency will be happening we see that uh, industrial work indus uh, workers in an industrial union would be a greater in number right we see that it's just the workers are more centralized on our side so therefore they are more strong they're stronger they're more powerful so therefore it is harder for the companies to ignore their demands it is easier for change because there's more that they can do an example could be the uk the, the railway strike in the uk we see that when the whole industry are coordinating to stop working the pressure that they give the government is incredibly uh, detrimental. They could cause the whole society to stop functioning. So therefore the demands could be made with quick changes because uh, of uh, the power that they could do. And onto the fourth reason of why with this increased efficiency of workforce, we tell that we gain long-term sustainability because we tell that when there are less repetitive work within a company and the workplace union, workers come and go. So it is very likely for the companies to refer back to their original habits because it's more convenient and more uh, cost efficient. However, if you're doing an industrial change, uh, this change would be permanent. So therefore we don't need people to continue fighting for the same rights or policies every time. So uh, before I move on to the impacts of uh, of having a higher efficiency, is there any POI at this point? You never prove why we need to unite different workers from different companies. Why can't they accomplish their specific interests by striking the specific company they work at? Okay, we tell that they want they will have the same goal because we tell that the the, the problems within an industry is co is coherent, right? We tell that in an industry, uh, the problems that people are saving uh, are are facing is very similar. As the example I've given you on on uh, how does the railway workers they want to strike for a better a better uh, a better uh, working environment and a, a shorter a shorter um, a better safety 
safety standards. We tell that these are the things that are common for all uh, industrial workers, and these are the most important stuff. As for individual companies, if you have individual demands, it's okay for you to have this choice to create a workforce company, but that is not the major goal uh, in the current status quo, and that is not the, not the most emer uh, not the most urgent issues. So back to the points of this uh, efficiency, improved efficiency in workforce. We 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 see that in two uh, perspectives. First, in workers, we tell that workers could argue for more rights because this is easier and more likely to get the rights with industrial union. And secondly, we tell that the workforce could divert their time and attention to doing real work instead of getting distracted. And th this leads on to the benefits of companies, obviously, um, um, having a more efficient workforce uh, so the company would gain more profits. And then second, the second perspective of this is on industry. So because we're initiating a change in one go, so and we ensure the quality of the sector and have standardized rules. So therefore, I'm so proud to oppose. Thank you. Well, thank you, Speaker, for the final remarks. I now invite the second speaker from side opposition. Great, and I would prefer verbal POIs. Awesome. With that. Proposition cannot win today's round by simply asserting that it's really, really good when people work together. That is, at its most fundamental level, just what a union is. What they had to prove to you is the necessity of having a single union to represent the interests of all employees across an entire industry. I am unclear as to why, when there is an industry-wide problem, specific workplaces cannot just individually unionize, why they need to all follow the exact same bureaucratic process that we think is going to be counterproductive and far less likely to achieve the needs and wants of workers. We are incredibly proud to oppose. A few things in my speech. First, a question on what exactly they're standing for. Second, a, note on, a quick note on framing. And this, then on to two questions for today's round and the third substance. Given that, I'm still very curious as to what industry change is. I want to remind you that Ben asked this question in OB1 and still with no response. All they say is it's like big structural changes, for example, better labor standards, increased wages. Yes, but like by who? Is this government policy? Are you lobbying elected politicians? Are you trying to get people out to the polls? Or are you now trying to work and have like every single CEO of major companies agree to the exact same workplace policies. I don't understand the logistics of this. They need to engage with that. Second then is they tell you that like in this last speech that they're going to be able to access like both types of union. I want to specific specify what the term to prefer means, right? When workers choose on which union to join, they are going to choose workplace ones, meaning that over time, industrial unions are inevitably going to decline as workplace ones increase in prominence, ultimately meaning you are going to have far fewer, if any. Given that, First question in today's round on who mobilizes and organizes unions the best. Why is this question so important in today's round and generally when trying to improve better workplace standards? Because you literally need the collective in order to have collective bargaining. Having people actually show up and be willing to join unions and be able to organize specific things like strikes to put pressures on company is the only way that unions actually achieve anything. Whether it is a union, a workplace union or an industry union, that is just like how they all function. This means that it, whoever wins this question is able to access the prerequisite to just like unions in general. Why do we do this better? Why do we get more mobilization and resources? For two reasons. Number one, we tell you that unions are always going to be a lot smaller. This leads to a few things. One, a lot easier recruitment. Second, it is easier to communicate with one another. Third, it is less bureaucratic. Fourth, it is regionally aligned in a lot of cases rather than being like spread out over the country. And five, this makes coordination a lot easier. 
I want to point out that this directly engages with their arguments about the unions being centralized and more efficient on their side of the house. This proposition is just practically impossible. It is always going to be harder to try to negotiate and organize and mobilize hundreds of thousands of people that do not even have the same employer, that are not usually based in the same part of the country, and are just like so many more of them in order to create things like massive amounts of strikes. That is why industry strikes are so rare compared to workplace strikes. Because just think about it. Like it is easy to walk up to the person whose cubicle is next to you and tell them like, oh, you should join a union or send out like an email blast to people that you know personally in order to do something like organize a strike. This is not something that happens with an industry union when you have hundreds of thousands of people, which inevitably creates a very complex bureaucracy, making organization very difficult. We told you this in the post speech. They literally didn't engage with any of the analysis. I think this is a major situation strategic flaw on their part. Second reason why is because we think that unions on are inherently more representative. No, but they tell you, they say that unions are like a company has too many sectors, a workplace union does not demonstrate like the interest of specific types of employees. First, we think that this is untrue. Workplace unions tend to be pretty tailored to like specific types of um, employees. But second, at their highest ground, people with different jobs in the same company probably have more similar issues than people that share the same job title technically, but work under completely different systems of leadership and authority issues, right? If racism and sexism is an issue between one specific company, it doesn't matter whether you're an analyst or whether you're a coder, you are still going to face those issues. I think that's a lot more likely than like a coder on one end of the country who works for one company having the exact same issues as a coder on the other end of the country. The impact of this is quite clear, right? Workers now you know see their personal issues being spoken to, especially when it comes down to like demographic differences that are always going to exist when you are dealing with things like geographical differences. The impact here is quite clear, right? People are willing to join. They are willing to do things like pay massive amounts of dues every year. They are willing to go on strike and risk losing money. They need to know that they are going to be heard, that they are going to see a return in order to do that because being in a union is always going to require a massive amount of sacrifice. They never engage with this. And what will World, are people going to be willing to spend thousands of dollars in union dues, be willing to give up the uh, give up getting like their they're getting their salary in order to protest for rights that they're not even sure they're represented in? Before I go on to our second question, I'll take that a point of view. Have Surely, don't you think that workers will still be more okay. anxious to voice Seeing out their none, opinions on a smaller scale? Oh, I'm so sorry. That was needed for that. Can you repeat that? Surely, don't you think that people people and workers will be more scared to voice out their opinions on a smaller scale to their employer? Right. We think that union workers are a lot less likely to voice their opinions when they don't actually have a specific target, right? Union workers currently know who they are working for. It is very tangible. They have a lot of access to their employers. This doesn't happen with industry-wide standards because they now suddenly have to fight people that they don't even work for. They're a lot less incentivized to do that. Second question on who gets access is the best policy and reform. Number one, we just think that this is unlikely to happen because industry leverage is a lot harder. We noted that it's very likely you're going to see like an industry-wide set strike, they never engage with this. But let's take them at their highest ground, say that they're able to mo mobilize. Why is all of their policy going to be quite bad? Because they are never going to be specific enough. Know that they claim that this is all based on assumptions. This ignores all of the analysis that Ben tells you. What? We think that companies are always going to have different problems and to different degrees. Amazon has a lot of prime day concerns over how people are treated when there is a lot of work over those 48 hours, whereas people who work at Target tend to have concerns over like what is acceptable customer interactions. Just because they both work in the same area and the same factories does not necessarily mean that they have the same problems. But second, let's take them at their highest ground, that unions are willing to pay attention to specific companies, meaning that this means specific problems. That means that that's a lot of specific issues you are dealing with. It is inevitably going to receive a lot less attention and a lot less investment on their side of the house because unions simply cannot afford to invest themselves fully in every single small problem that all companies have. This doesn't happen in union problems because that's all they're focused for. Second is that companies have different capabilities, right? What Starbucks can afford to do is different from what your local coffee chain can afford to do. On opposition, they have to go for the lowest common denominator because it's industry-wide, meaning that one, people don't get all the benefits they possibly could get, which means that the conditions are worse than they could be for workers on our side. But second, and a lot worse, is that a lot of really specific issues get overlooked because they don't represent like very broad ones. Industry-wide problems can exist in workplaces. In that case, workplace unions can address them. But when there are workplace-specific issues, industry unions are unable to deal with. 
That's the comparative they have to engage with. Third sub then on societal harms. Thesis here is it's really bad for the economy when entire industries go on strike. Because even if conditions in some companies increase, the entire industry as a whole has to strike. Meaning that nationally, they're going to be shut down for weeks. This happens to the most severe degree because oftentimes best policy is considered that you can't like fire striking employees. Meaning that they're going to lose out on entire sectors of the economy. All businesses are going to stop like producing and distributing for weeks and months on end. This is really bad because they are eventually not even striking for a cause because some people have gotten what they already need. This is like detrimental for the economy at large because it's ruining companies that employ thousands of people. All of this fueling anti-union sentiment as it takes an incredibly detrimental toll on the economy as a whole, making it harder to get things done in the future, how to oppose. I'm the speaker for defined remarks. I now invite the government for. I prefer my POIs audibly. We never denied the benefits of workplace unions, and we think that it is legitimate for both to exist. But ultimately, we think that due to industrial unions involving the government as a stakeholder, it makes it more likely for the rights of workers to actually be protected on our side of the house. We have told you very clearly in the first speaker that we see how like structural change is actually happening by having like these industrial unions pressure the government in two ways, either through like strikes or online signatures or having like leaders of industrial unions direct negotiating with the government to achieve um, an improvement in these um, standards in the industry. So moving on to like the two main points of clash within this, uh, within this debate, we think it's firstly on the rights for the workers who achieves better rights for the workers, and secondly, on the efficiency of this um, mechanism. Moving on to the first point of clash on the rights for workers, our first speaker told you very clearly why the workplace union is less likely to achieve better rights for workers due to biases or conflicts of object objectives that may exist in the workplace, whereas on the comparative with you, industrial unions, we're able to fight for workers' rights better, as we think that the government is a stakeholder that acts in a better interest compared to companies, and that's like they would actually care about the interest of the workers more rather than the companies perhaps focusing on like profit maximizing objectives, and we think that's the political pressure put on the government by industrial unions is more likely to lead to a response from the government. So what response that we received from opposition? They told us two things. Firstly, they think that it's significantly worse on our side of the house for people to reflect their views as like they, they think that the industry is very broad. And secondly, on how they think that it's less likely for minorities to have their voices heard. Our response towards their first statement is that we don't think it's true. We tell you that individuals are less likely to be seen as whistleblowers on our side of the house due to the fact that there is like a small amount of people in the workplace in the workplace, it is more likely for the workers to be targeted by the managerial people within the company as there is a very direct and obvious conflict of interest. And whereas for like industrial, like for industry wide standards to be achieved, usually only on our side of the house, usually only the leaders of the industrial unions need to act as a representative to negotiate for the rights of workers on their behalf. And it's less likely for the people who for people to actually need the confidence to negotiate face to face with their bosses and for them to actually worry about maybe getting sacked from their job because of the fact that they're going against their bosses um, being involved in this workplace union. And it's less likely for people to face discrimination in the workplace on our side of the house, which is why we think that it's very untrue that they say that like people um, are able to reflect the abuse more on their side of the house. And with regards to their second statement on how minorities are less likely to have their voices heard, we tell you that it is more likely for them to have their voices heard, as we have proven to you in the analysis that it is likely for minorities to actually express their opinions in industrial unions, because a lot of the times you're able to act like rather anonymous anonymously compared to like in their side of the house, and thus it's less likely for them to be discriminated, discriminated against, as I've mentioned previously just now. They then told us that they have better representation for workers on their side of the house as workers in different com companies have different problems and they don't think we should use like this one size fit all policy. Firstly, we don't think it's true that um, workers in different companies have different problems. Sorry, uh, is that a point? Yes. Yeah, I'll take it. On our side of the house, we still have lobbying against governments that's symmetric. But on your side of the house, you have to do strikes that sort of like tell the entire, like a lot of companies all at once, they must change their practices or you strike forever. How is that sustainable? 
no, we don't think we're only relying on strikes on our side of the house. Rather than that, we think that on our side of the house, we're actually being able to put more political pressure on the government to actually enact some change, right? Even if like these strikes like even if we can't like continuously do the strikes we believe that these strikes are actually more effective in achieving what we can achieve in terms of like industrial standards whereas on your side of the house it's very unlikely for um that to actually occur effectively as i've mentioned just now because of how people are actually scared of reflecting their own views and we don't think that union that workplace union can achieve the same as what we can achieve on our side uh, back to our point of clash on why we don't think it's true that's like workers in different companies usually have like different problems. We think that ultimately workers in industries are likely to have similar problems, such as like high needing for higher wages due to the fact that like the industry, like companies work side and side within the industry and like demand and supply of workers working in this, in this entire industry, like with, with like regarding the wages, we think that it's likely that people will actually face the same problems in different companies and for example, like it is likely for companies in the same industry to also be facing the same problems, for example, like safety standards, because we think that companies usually follow legislation outlined by the government. And if these legislations are not updated, it's likely that the policies are not updated for these companies as well. So we think that it's very likely that they face the same problems. And even if we assume that workers may have different problems, we think that this only applies to the minority of cases, which in the in that case, we think that they can turn to these workplace unions for help. But for the majority of problems, we think that it is likely for the industrial unions to actually be able to achieve better rights for um, everyone. And we think that it's very unlikely we have to dilute the wants of workers on our side of, on our side of the house, as we think that industrial unions have more centralized power and the actions of the union can impact the running of the whole industry as a whole. Thus, we think that in order to achieve a goal, it's more likely for industrial unions to stand firm on their ground to fight for what they want, as they have more support from workers and they do not have to fear backlash from individual companies if the problem is legitimate. Due to the fact that the work of these industrial unions are actually public or like publicized, we think that it is more likely for these in issues to gain public support to actually pressurize companies or pressurize the government to change industry standards, whereas on their side of the house, it is more likely that they will actually have to dilute the wants of workers as companies are less likely to act, have to like are less likely to actually negotiate fully with workers due to clashing objectives they have. For example, profit maximizing, which we have already outlined clearly in our first speaker, and the fact that managers of these companies ultimately have more power over these workers, and thus they achieve, on their side of the, of the house, they achieve less for the rights of workers. And we think that we win this clash because firstly, we proved to you why it's unlikely for workers' rights to be achieved on their side. And basically, we think that this is the most important clash because we think that the workers are the main stakeholders within this debate and we do the best for them. Moving on to the next clash on the efficiency of the workplace, our second speaker then told you very clearly why change occurring on our side is more sustainable and why industrial unions can increase the efficiency of the workforce in a few ways. And opposition, how they responded was that they said that coordinating or like organization is easier on easier on our, on their side and it's less likely that we can do things on our side but we firstly uh, regarding our response we don't think you need to communicate everything in the same place we think it can occur online we don't think um like negative sentiment throughout the industry need to occur in the same place and needs to be as coordinated as they think they need to be. And secondly, we think that industrial unions tend to have a better structure within as they're set up for a longer period of time, whereas it's usually the structure within these workplace unions are messier because there are less people and it's less likely that people are actually that um, engaged in setting up a very good structure for these workplace unions. And then they tell us, about like how they have better effectiveness of unions because they think that people are reluctant to join un unions on our side of the house due to time and union stigma. We think that it's the same on their side of the house. And we think that it's the same that they need to use time to join unions and they on their side of the house, they even face more stigma as I mentioned previously on how they, it's likely for people to get discriminated. Therefore, we're very proud to propose. Speaker for defined remarks, I now invite the third speaker from side opposition. All right, um, I prefer um, verbal voice, please. 
the biggest fear of a worker when it comes to deciding if they should join a union or not is not when they get to the union, if they will speak up because they fear they might be discriminated against or they might not be able to remain anonymous. It is if they should join the union in the first place. They already feel retaliation. It is a massive waste use of their time. They have money that is spent in this, this. They worry if it will ever create any tangible impact for them. To these people, proposition says, well, we're going to lobby the government and hope that your rights as a worker are enough of a priority for the government to outweigh, outweigh economic or political concerns and hope that that is a way for you to get change. We say this is not only never likely to happen, it is also far worse than the alternative proud to oppose. In this speech, I'm going to give two points of tension proposition down proposition's bench then debate the rest of the debate in three clashes. Two points of tension then. First, I think there was a massive stance change in the last speech of the proposition where they say, no, our side of the house is lobbying directly against governments, whereas opposition is against companies. Here's the, here's the idea. First of all, we don't think this is the scenario in the first place, right? We think both sides of the house are addressing companies are largely as a whole. Our side of the house addresses specific companies directly. Their side, their side of the house addresses the group as a collective. But if it is true that their side of the house is truly like effectively a special interest group, where these groups like lobby the government and they do it all collectively with the house the scenario. This is the worst case scenario because it is so much less likely that a government who is balancing every economic incentive of, of like and every interest that a voter has outside of economics and the interests of workers all together, that is the least likely scenario in which the interest of any worker at all is considered in governmental action and changes mid, let alone the fact that every worker is not the same and they have different incentives down the line. Their best case scenario is when the government like, like creates minor change in the least common, or in the, like the issue that is the least common denominator among every worker, we say that is not only like what workers want the least it is probably way unlikely to happen. Secondly, a proposition repeats down the bench that they can have both in their side of the house. Here's the problem. In a perverse debate, this is about in scenarios in which workers and people are choosing between the two, which should they prefer as we choose. We say we would ha rather have less industry-wide unions in favor of more specific unions because that addresses people's specific lives better. With that, three clashes in the round. The first clash is on the broad strength of unions. I want to note, this is the single most important impact of the round. This is because unions are reliant on worker participation. If we prove we get less people less people on proposition side of the house that are interested in joining a union, regardless of what kind of union that is, we win the round because we have more unions on our side of the house, regardless of what form they take. Notably, this was framing we gave you from the one it never got engaged with. What did we say? We said workers are extremely skeptical of joining unions because of the time, financial costs, and just general fear that they will be retaliated against for making that choice, right? In the status quo, the biggest stigma against unions right now is the idea that they are bureaucratic and undemocratic and that workers are effectively wasting their money for a response they will never get in return. We say the status quo stigma is only perpetuated in, in, in proposition side of the house when they say we wait and we hope that we participate in a really, really large union and hope that eventually the issue that is most important for us actually comes to the table becomes yeah, well, a really, really central issue for the union. We say this is unlikely, but even if it's likely to happen, we say no worker believes the like believes like is an agreement about what is the single most important issue. So we say we give each union worker exactly what they want, whereas their side of the house like relies on the idea of all of them sort of believing the same way and having the same rights on the down the bench. The second thing we said is our third substantive argument that got no engagement, right? We said there's massive public backlash to industry-wide strikes because they affect the economy far more directly and far more widely than a company-wide strike. No economy is reliant on one company, maybe outside of Amazon, but I even think that is kind of unlikely. Whereas if industry-wide like, strikes occur, I think entire com economies are at least affected in the short term. For example, if all of Japan's automation workers strike, I think that would be a really, really massive problem for every citizen there. Whereas if Toyota strike, I don't think they would care nearly as much. Why does this matter? One, obviously there's an economic impact. Why? Right? that affects people that had no real impact on the reason why problems exist in the first place. But second, it drains long-term buy-in and the like, and the bargaining power of unions. If the public is against unions, if they feel like they're disruptive to society, they make it harder for them to like feed their families, right? All of this is a reason why unions have less political capital to do all of the government buying the proposition ones and also get all the members that are necessary to achieve any union action at all. Third, 
even if participation isn't lower on their side of the house, it is still that like energy to participate in actual things like strikes or collective bargaining is, right? So even if they still get people, they're still paying the dues and like technically call themselves a member of the union, they're less likely to strike, which means the actual like leverage behind any action that a union does ultimately goes away. What is the impact of this? It is that workers lose their biggest advocate. In the status quo, exploitation is on the rise and jobs are ultimately more dangerous and more exploited than they were before. We need unions more than ever. We need to combat the idea they're undemocratic so that workers feel they are without places for them to put their time and money into. On their side of the house, we both agree unions are important. Only our side sustains the impact of unions long-term. Before I move on, I'll take your point. How are companies incentivized to actually negotiate with workers if they face no pressure at all on your side of the house? Effectively, a union has one big leverage, is that if people work for the company and can decide not to work for the company at any time, that is a strike. On their side of the house, they do not prove what alternative form of bargaining or like leverage a union has, right? Their side of the house has to employ really large, wide scale, scale industry wide strikes. On our side, we say company wide strikes are more likely to occur and are more effective because those are actually the, the workers that are affecting in the first place. Second clashes on representation. We gave you three arguments. I think only one of them was really rejected, which is the idea of like, there are not really that many issues that every specific union or, or company faces differently. We say, fine. Even if this is true, there are still varying degrees to which each worker experiences these issues. So while every worker might be generally concerned with things like safety and also their pay, some might be way more concerned with their safety compared to pay in the first place, because they feel like that is a far more tangible threat to their lives. On their side of the house, they ask you to like, like pull their resources and then say, pick one of the two to fight for at a mass level. We say this is unfair and likely just not responsive to what workers need on an individual level. So we get better prioritization that affects workers on an individual level. Secondly, though, the unity the workers feel is far more likely to continue on our side of the house. Workers are just more similar to each other when they're fighting against the same company. Decisions against collective action will be like more representative of a much, much larger group on our side of the house. Why does this matter? Importantly, I think the, the way that they never addressed, right, was that industry-wide problems are also company-wide problems. We address industry-wide pro problems, maybe not the same order, but they ultimately get addressed. But company-wide problems are not likely to be industry-wide problems, at least not all the time. We address both. They only address one. They never engage with that. Lastly, on effectiveness. We just think they're less likely to strike and sustain a strike in propositions world. It is harder to mobilize and get enough group support to do this. You have to like, a worker has to feel that the issue affects them. Their company is particularly egregious on that issue. And they have to have faith in the long-term effectiveness of a strike to participate in and to participate in a, a long-term manner. We do not think this is likely. Second of all, we said recruitment and messaging get way worse on their side of the house because the issues are broad. They're the least common denominator. On our side of the house, it's the issue that matters to a person the most, which is most likely to get them to join. It's most likely to get them to be a participatory and active member. We say a union is only as strong as its members. We motivate its members to stay and motivate them to be active. Very proud to stand in the opposition. Um, speaker for defined remarks, I now invite the opposition reply. All right, uh, am I still audible? Yes, awesome. you are. This round has boiled down to two things, effectiveness and representation. Let's first talk about effectiveness. I'm gonna assume the highest ground for side proposition that all companies have the same interests and the same problems. Why do we still win this debate? We give you two warrants down the line that weren't properly engaged with by, by side proposition. Number one, you got more membership recruitment on our side of the house. It was easier to recruit people at a local level rather than at an industry-wide level because people had connections and trust with the recruiters in the workplace, and B, because there was more specific messaging in the workplace. So it was more persuasive to join a union that was at your workplace that talked about your issues rather than an industry-wide union. 
Secondly, it was far easier to organize a union at a local level. In a smaller workplace, it's easier to communicate with people and it's easier to unify them because there's a smaller number of people and they tend to have common issues. They tend to be the same people that you see at lunch every single day, the same people that you work next to. So rallying around people was significantly easier in a smaller confine of a single workplace than a broad-based industry. The problem on their side of the house is that they needed buy-in from every single worker to get massive levels of change. And we told you down the bench that things like fracturing and competing interests was likely to happen. So the sustained changes that they like ha said what, that they said would happen on their side of the house was very unlikely. So in the short term, what happens on their side of the house? Either number one, they don't get change because they're not able to galvanize people to a significant extent. But second of all, even if they do get change, there's a race to the bottom effect where people shoot for the lowest baseline in order to get broad-based support from everyone. What was the new like counterfactual that they gave on their side of the house that I think actually hurts them? They say that, well, they're no longer negotiating with companies, they're negotiating with the government. Cam told you that the government is even worse than individual companies because the government has so many legislative priorities. The government has so many different people that are lobbying them. There's gridlock, there's, part, there, there's partisanship as well. Not just that, I want you to think about this on a level of scale. The government has to answer to every single citizen in a country to get reelected. On the other hand, if workers don't work for a company, the company goes under. That means on a workplace level, workers have more leverage than if they're trying to go and like organize on a political level. So if their counterfactual was about government, they basically knifed themselves because that was significantly less likely to lead to change. So what was the long-term impact of this? The long-term impact is you saw massive decreases in union membership. Because what we told you down the off bench is that the cost to union membership were high, that there was time, there was money, there was stigma around unions. So people would only join unions if there were immediate returns. So insofar as on their side of the house, it takes years to lobby governments or years to convince the CEO of every company in an industry to get gain reforms, people would simply leave the union because they realize that the costs completely outweigh the benefits. So even if on our side of the house, we don't get broad-based industry level change, we still meet the needs of people, which ensures that unions stay along for the long term. Second thing I want to talk about is about representation. We told you that companies would inevitably face different issues. As Cam and Hannah told you, there's differences in leadership strategies, there's differences in the size and profits of companies, and the demographics of companies. So even if they face similar issues, the severity of those issues is still different. Why was that important? As Cam told you, the industry-wide problems that they talk about would be solved in either world. If everyone agreed that an issue was a problem, they could always lobby their union or strike to create change at the company-wide level. The problem is the company specific issues never get resolved on their side of the house. The harassment issues, the diversity issues that are specific to a company never get the broad based support across the industry to actually get solved. So their benefits were completely symmetrical, but the costs were unique to their side of the house because they weren't able to solve the specific issues that occurred. We think that we should prioritize the harms that most disproportionately affect workers. That's why representation was so important. At the end of the day, our side was the clear winner. We not only ensured effective change and unity, but we also ensured representation for every single worker. That's the point of a union proud to oppose. Thank you, Speaker, for the final remarks. I now invite the Governor Platt to conclude this debate. Ladies and gentlemen, what are the metrics of judging this debate? There are two questions that we should look at. First, what are the issues? What issues are more important? Industrial issues or workplace specific issues? And second question, who is more likely to get to get the change? On to the first question of what issues are more important. Today's side proposition keeps stressing that when you join a workplace union, you can join an industrial union. But we, we have repeatedly told you that it is not true. We believe that if you have a choice between joining an industrial union or a workplace union, we will just prioritize industrial union because it makes bigger change, equal change for all workers in the industry. And we believe that this change is the common most urgent issue for all workers in the industry. So therefore, it is much more important for the workers to join the industrial union. 
As for workplace union for specific changes, uh, small specific changes, we believe that um, if, if they feel it's necessary, then they could like make another workplace union. Uh, we don't think there's any uh, conflict of interest in between this, um, but just that we, we believe that all workers should prioritize joining industrial unions because of the scale of the change that we have as uh, we have repeatedly um, mentioned throughout our case. And interestingly, side, prop, side uh, proposition have never denied the import, side opposition have never denied the importance of industrial change. So to make things easier, they said that industrial change can be done on a workforce level. And they say that, ah, even, it will be even more efficient because there's less red tape or uh, less uh, bureaucracy. But we have repeatedly told you that, um, we have repeatedly told you that this is not true, right? We tell that the problem exists first, and this is common for all workers because more or less they have they are facing the same thing, and they would more or less they want to increase wage to reduce working hours to have more welfare. But then in my speech, I provided you four reasons why it is more efficient in the industrial uh, in an industrial union to get uh, to get to get the change because first it is a less repetitive work done by uh, by the by the workers and secondly there's more uh, intelligence on uh, how the change can be best made and thirdly on why is this more powerful with greater people and how it could exert pressure on the government and fourthly how it could um, have a long-term sustainability uh, by having this uh, new stand new standards within the industry and how it would uh, uh, raise the uh, and raise the a barrier of entry within the industry. We heard no response from that. And then they continue to say that if the workers are coordinating, and they continue to say that if the workers are actually coordinating, then they are afraid that the, the, the people, okay, sorry. Um, so therefore we have proven to you that this is more important for industrial change to be made. And we tell that industrial change, in order for industrial change to be made, it is better for uh, industrial uh, union to do that. And then on the second question, who's more likely to get change? So I'd like to address your misconstruement of our case. We said that uh, our stance has not changed from the beginning. We've told you from the beginning that the government is a better actor for initiating change because it has, the, the government has the obligation to protect the rights uh, of the workers. And we tell that uh, versus uh, companies which were profit driven, it is more likely for the government to have better motivation to create meaningful change within the workforce. Interestingly, they have also admitted that we'll get better collective actions and put pressure to the government. But then they start to worry that this scale of destruction is bad to the economy. And because that the workers don't want to be seen as destructive, they wouldn't want to join. However, we see this as ridiculous because putting uh, pressure on the on the government is a good thing because they're finally the workers are able to express their dissatisfaction and then which is the dissatisfaction, which is the whole purpose of the union. Um, and they can finally make changes. On the other hand, we have told you from the first point of the first speech that there's ultimate uh, conflict between and, and dependence between the workers and their bosses. So therefore, the workers will feel pressured to make comments. So we get no reply from that other than the shallow one-liner that um, uh, they could always strike. So therefore, even uh, assuming the best case from side uh, side uh, proposition, we see that the workers uh, work workers would. Uh, workers will be better on our side. Thank you. Well, thank you, Speaker, for defined remarks. I thank all speakers. What an excellent debate. I'll now request the speakers to remain in this breakout uh, in this breakout room. I request the judges to join. Give me a second. Uh, prop prep one. We'll deliberate over there. <laughs> 